This video is sponsored by Startmail. Perhaps the most lethal and feared fighting force of the Bronze and Iron Ages, the Assyrian military machine was like no other during its time. With the ability to mobilize hundreds of thousands of men in a geographic region stretching from the Zagros Mountains of Iran to the banks of the Nile in Egypt, the Assyrian armed forces were second to none. And yet, the Assyrian people started out as mere merchants and farmers, not military men. So then, how did a small, relatively insignificant shrine town give birth to one of the ancient world's most effective military machines? We'll take a look at this, as well as the different units of the armed forces that the Assyrians used to build and maintain the greatest empire that up until their day, the world had ever seen. The city of Asher initially was a relatively small shrine town dedicated to a god of the same name. Built atop a small crag that overlooked the Tigris River, it was surrounded by relatively good farmland. By 2000 BC, the shrine settlement had grown into a small city whose industrious population had become quite wealthy by acting as middlemen in the tin and textile trade between Anatolia and Babylonia. Politically though, Asher was relatively insignificant, and its early kings had few territorial ambitions beyond its immediate area. In fact, it was incorporated into the empires of others, most notably the Akkadian Empire during the reign of Naram-Sin, and later the Neo-Sumerian Empire under its illustrious ruler, Shulgi. Kings from the dynasties of both states seem to have allowed the local Assyrians to carry on as usual, and even bestowed gifts to the Temple of Asher as offerings. In the early 18th century BC, Asher was taken over by Shamshi Adad, the Amorite warlord of the neighboring city of Ekalatum. He seems to have liked the city so much that he remained there for a few years and donated large sums of money to the Temple of Asher for its upkeep. Upon the demise of Shamshi Adad's kingdom, Asher became part of Hammurabi of Babylon's growing empire. But again, like with previous conquerors, life changed little for the city and its inhabitants. As long as they paid tribute to whoever the leading power of the day was, the Assyrian people of Asher really had nothing to fear. Unfortunately, this sense of security would all end in the 15th century BC with an event that would change Asher and the Assyrian people forever. Speaking of security, I'd like to thank this video's sponsor, Startmail. For those of you unfamiliar with it, Startmail is the world's most private email service and safeguards your data, activity, and privacy. With all of the free email services out there, why would you need Startmail? It's because these other services aren't exactly completely free. You're paying for them with your privacy and data. Your data, emails, whatever you do using your free account can be used by these companies, marketing agencies, perhaps even the government of the country you're in. And who knows who else? Not so with Startmail, which uses PGP encryption, the most secure encryption available. It's pretty easy to use. You just log in, go over your encryption options, create aliases, and a bunch of other stuff to help protect your privacy. As you can also see, there are no annoying ads. You just write, encrypt, and securely send your email. Startmail also includes features like extra secure data storage, disposable alias email addresses, easy to use click encryption, and so much more. So if you want the securest email possible, go to startmail.com history with Sai for 50% off your first year. Again, go to the link in my description for 50% off your first year. Protect your privacy with Startmail. In the year 1595 BC, the expansionist Hittite Empire under their young king, Murshili I, marched along the Euphrates River and deep into the heart of Babylonia, plundering the towns and cities that he came across, including the capital of Babylon itself. He didn't stay very long, 
and soon headed back west to Anatolia to take care of matters there. During his campaigns, Mursili and his army passed through territory controlled by a people known as the Hurrians. At the time, they were organized into little fiefdoms, but the Hittite incursion into Babylonia had scared them enough that within the span of a generation or two, they organized themselves into what became known as the Kingdom of the Mitanni. Unifying into a single state was probably the best way for the Hurrian peoples to defend themselves from outside threats. However, the Mitanni also launched their own offensive operations in various parts of Upper Mesopotamia. One of these was in the 15th century BC against the city of Asher, where the Mitanni king, Shaushtatar, sacked the city and plundered the temple of its god. Upon leaving, he carried off one of the doors of the temple that was made of gold and silver. This was the first time in recorded history that such an affront had taken place in Asher. Even worse was that the Assyrians in Asher had to live under Mitanni subjugation for the next century. The silver lining, though, was that the Assyrian people, who up until then had been primarily merchants and farmers, were able to learn a thing or two about warfare from their Mitanni overlords. Sources on early Assyrian warfare are almost non-existent. During the old Assyrian period, what some might have considered to have been the Assyrian armed forces was in reality just a heavily armed police force. Along with its defensive walls, such a force protected the city, its temple, and residents from attack. The main threats at the time being hostile tribes that might try to raid and plunder the city of its treasures. However, when Asher first became part of the empire of Shamshi Adad in the 18th century BC, men from the city were conscripted into his army. Though there are no specific Assyrian texts on the matter, letters from the archives at Mari, another city on the Euphrates west of Asher, tell of how foot soldiers were recruited locally from cities such as Asher to fight Shamshi Adad's wars. Despite joining a large army, these were still simple men whose previous military skills primarily consisted of using bows and arrows and short sickles, which were the same objects that they would have used for hunting and farming. Eventually, they were equipped with spears, axes, and short swords made of bronze, and organized into units of 10 up to 100, which were ultimately all part of a larger, diverse fighting force that could number into the thousands. The years roughly between 1700 to 1400 BC are a virtual blank when it comes to Assyrian warfare, but soon after that, we get a lot more information, probably due to the Mitanni state collapsing under Hittite pressure and Assyria gaining its independence. Texts from the period tell of more extensive training, with troops now wearing metal body armor and equipped with better weapons as well as more resources being devoted to what seems to have been a standing army. What's more is that the Assyrians learned from and adapted their style of combat to match that of their opponents. For example, cavalry and even chariot divisions became a greater part of the army, something that was most definitely adopted from the Mitanni. In fact, a horse training manual in Hurrian has been found, and the Hurrian word, Marianu, was used in Assyrian texts for chariot driver, as was use of the military title, Turtanu, that the Mitanni used. Other texts also mention Kassite horsemen from the Zagros Mountains who served the Assyrians as riding specialists. Perhaps the greatest change, though, was the Assyrian mentality towards warfare and their neighbors. It was now no longer enough to simply defend one's homeland from foreign threats. Assyria now had to be proactive against its future enemies. The Mitanni might be gone, but the Hittites, Babylonians, and a resurgent Egypt, let alone the lawless hill tribes to the north and the east, all constituted threats to Assyrian life and sovereignty. It's during the Neo-Assyrian period, when the Assyrian Empire was at its height and stretched from the Zagros Mountains 
all the way to the Mediterranean Sea that its army as we know it came into being. Thanks to many of the administrative, supply, and logistical documents that have been uncovered and translated over the past several decades, we have a pretty decent idea of how the Assyrian armed forces were organized. Unfortunately, these texts don't really tell us too much about battle tactics. At its core was the Kisir Shari, which roughly translates to the King's Unit. This was believed to have been the main Assyrian standing army that was always ready to do battle and go wherever the king needed it. Each unit consisted of 1,000 soldiers, but could be subdivided into smaller units that were divisible by 10. Most of the Kisir Shari were infantry and made up not just of Assyrians from the heartland, but also men conscripted from the provinces. It should be noted that the Assyrian army contained men from all regions of the empire, and of all ethnicities. In theory, there was no requirement as to who could fight for the Assyrian king, or even hold a high position of command within the armed forces, although these positions were often held by members of the royal family, or sometimes trusted eunuchs. However, during and after the reign, of Tiglath-Pileser III, the military became more of a meritocracy. In addition, former enemies could become trusted allies. One group were the Ituian archers, who were members of an Aramean tribe that had fought tenaciously against the Assyrians in the past. By the time of Sennacherib and Isarhaddon, they were one of the most respected and trusted groups of the Assyrian armed forces. Even skilled archers from Elam, the traditional enemies of Assyria during the Neo-Assyrian period, were recruited in service of the king. As long as one proved loyal to the Assyrian crown, they could move up rather quickly within the ranks of the armed forces. There were three broad groups of infantry, light, regular, and heavy. Light infantry could be simple spearmen and archers. In Neo-Assyrian art, they're usually depicted wearing headbands and barefoot. Next were the regular infantry, the most numerous group within the Assyrian army. Having similar weapons as light infantrymen, they wore pointed bronze helmets and sometimes light body armor. The most feared units though were the heavy infantrymen, whose ranks included not only archers and spearmen, but also slingers. They were the shock troops and were trained to fight in close formation in pitched battles and often wore scale armor, boots, and more ornate helmets. In battle, they generally carried a spear, short sword, and a shield. It was they who stormed city gates with battering rams or scaled the walls with siege towers. During the Neo-Assyrian period, cavalry became one of the most important units of the armed forces. The horses used were small by today's standards, and generally bred in the mountains and steppes to the north of the Assyrian heartland, or sometimes captured from neighboring peoples, such as the Urartrians and the Medes. All soldiers on horseback carried a sword, but they were also divided into two distinct groups, lancers and archers. As with infantry, there were many non-Assyrians within the ranks of the cavalry. This included men from some of Assyria's greatest rivals, such as Urartu and various tribes of Medes, the latter who are reported to have had the best horses. At the empire's height under Ashurbanipal, around 650 or 640 BC, horses, especially those belonging to cavalry officers, wore leather armor over their necks and bodies with their foreheads protected by a bronze, or sometimes, ivory plaque. Chariots were also used by the Assyrian army. In most cases, the chariot's crew was made up of some top official, for example, a nobleman, general, or a king. This individual functioned as an archer and had a quiver of 50 arrows. His elevated height gave him an advantage while picking off targets. Along with him was the chariot driver 
and a man with a shield who protected the others. The chariots also supported the infantry by chasing and running down fleeing enemies. Infantry, cavalry, and chariots. These were the main types of fighting units within the Assyrian army, but there were several non-combatants that were also important to any campaign's success. Cooks, logistical officers, doctors, and diviners all accompanied troops into battle. Armies also had with them scouts, guides, spies, and interpreters, especially for campaigns outside of Assyrian territory. So I hope that you now have a much better idea about one of the ancient world's most fearsome and highly capable fighting forces. More on ancient Assyria to come, so stay tuned. Anyway. I'd really like to thank Grandkick69, Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, WenXTV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Faridun Dadachanji, Jimmy Daruwala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe. <laughs>